Hello, everyone. I'm Kevin Mizikar, town manager, and I'm joined today by Kristen Lass, assistant town manager for community development and human services. And we'll be leading you through a discussion of all 48 warrant articles on the annual town meeting warrant, which is scheduled for Saturday, May 21st, 2022 at 830 a.m. at the Oak Middle School. So we look uh, to have town meeting uh, back at its uh, traditional venue after a couple of years of having the annual town meeting in other locations due to COVID-19. Uh, town meeting members will be uh, certainly have the option to wear a mask, but no masking requirements. Uh, uh, there will be no masking requirements and we'll give individuals the opportunity to spread out through uh, the Oak Middle School Auditorium. Uh, so we can conduct the business of our legislative body, which is town meeting. So congratulations to all reelected and newly elected town meeting members. Uh, we look forward to a productive day uh, on Saturday, May 21st. So uh, the goal of this uh, recording is to get town meeting members up to speed and a little bit more detailed information with regards to the Warren articles that you will consider. Uh, this information should be considered supplemental to both the mailing that will go out to all town meeting members, which will include the warrant and the work of the Finance Committee and the Board of Selectmen at their and Planning Board at their various public hearing processes that have led up to uh, the creation of and consideration of this warrant. So there's a lot of information out there that's been made available through Shrewsbury Media Connection in the Town of Shrewsbury webpage. I'd like to take the opportunity to thank Mark, Sarah, and Shrewsbury Media Connection for not only their production of this taping, but also their coverage of all the public meetings and hearings uh, that I've previously mentioned. So Kristen, welcome. Um, thanks for your support and not only the creation of the warrant, but also in our review of all those or warrant articles today. Um, so why don't you uh, take the lead and we'll uh, start at the top of the warrant with Article 1. Great. Um, thank you, Mr. Mizikar. Uh, we would like to walk through every single article uh, for you as town meeting members to review on your own, as we said before, and give you a little bit more extra information that will come with your uh, packet uh, when it is mailed on Friday, uh, May 6th. So Article 1, Mr. Mizikar, this is a traditional article that we generally see at town meeting to accept the report of the Beale Early Childhood Center Building Committee. Uh, some may question this because the building has been up and running since September. Uh, could you give us a sense of sure. the report and why it is being made? Sure. So this would be a report of the activity of the committee since the last annual town meeting. And this is a tradition because town meeting established the building committee. Um, and therefore the building committee is reporting back to the entity that, that created it. And uh, while we have made great progress and the building has been open since last fall, we continue to complete the final details of the punch list uh, and do financial and other reporting with the Massachusetts School Building Authority, the MSBA. I am very proud to report at the building committee's most recent meeting in April of 2022. The owner's project manager identified that this project it will come in roughly $11.6 million under budget. So that's a, an amazing uh, benefit for the community that we don't have to borrow uh, those funds and keep the tax rate low as we always aim to do. That's great. It will be great to hear the official report from that building committee. Moving on to Article 2, this deals with uh, Article 2 of the General Bylaws and is uh, Section 11, where we currently use Cushing's Manual for town meeting and are looking to replace that with town meeting time. Mr. Mizikar, could you explain a little bit uh, behind that article? Sure. So this is an, in, an initiative of moderator Jim Kane. Uh, he brought this forward. Now, Cushing's Manual defines the parliamentary procedures or the rules and regulations of town meeting, and Cushing's Manual is a very old document uh, that is one of a few parliamentary procedures out there, but it's very rarely used uh, just because, uh, in fact, it's hard to be transparent whenever you can't even get your hands on the, the actual document anymore. There's only a few that we know of out there in general circulation, and one of them is held by the moderator. So the moderator's initiative is to increase transparency and allow everyone to better understand how our town meeting will operate. And like many other communities in the Commonwealth, he's proposing the use of uh, the procedures known as town meeting time um, that we would uh, follow um, along with the uh, other standing traditions of our particular town meeting here in Shrewsbury for how we operate um, when we're in session. Great, thank you. 
Moving on to Article 3, this is another traditional article that we see related to um, the transfer of money to pay past year's departmental bills. Uh, could you explain that, please? Right. So this is actually, uh, as we do a lot of years as well, we don't have any prior year bills. Uh, if anyone would if any would pop up between now and town meeting, we may want to reconsider this, but at this time we would not recommend the adoption of this article. And Article 4 is an article uh, to move or appropriate different funds from different departments uh, for fiscal year 22. Could you explain uh, what this means? Sure. So fiscal year 22 is the current fiscal year that we're in that ends this June 30th, and this would allow us the opportunity to make any adjustments if we're having any technical budget issues within any departments where we need town meetings appropriating authority. Uh, we do not have any proposed transfers. Uh, there's only been one limited transfer of the reserve fund with the finance committee. So all in all, the budget's in very good shape and uh, we'd recommend the feed of this article as well. Article five is the largest budget item in the, the warrant. This is our town budget, which includes town and schools. Uh, Mr. Mizakar, could you give us a brief overview of what this means? Absolutely. So uh, this is the full and primary uh, spending plan for the community for the upcoming fiscal year from July 1 through June 30th of 2023. Um, and this is a, a, a request to appropriate $1 million $138,433,515 um, for use in the general expenditure and operation of all town departments, including the school department. Um, so um, this is will be a uh, kind of an outsized article at town meeting at, as it deserves its time. Uh, and we will go through department by department and the moderator will see if there's any questions regarding the spending in, in three primary categories for each department, which would be salaries and wages, uh, general expenditures uh, outside of salary and wages, and then any separate appropriations that would be permissible over uh, more than a single fiscal year for a particular purpose. So again, uh, it is the primary spending plan. The Finance Committee actually spent in total uh, about 10 hours deliberating and reviewing each and every uh, line item within the, the uh, annual operating budget and uh, has favorably uh, recommended the town meeting adopt the budget, but we will take the time at town meeting to illustrate the spending plan um, and answer any questions of town meeting members for um, what we will do for next fiscal year. Great, and just wanted to put a plug that we do have the entire budget online under our ClearGov tool. Our uh, business management analyst, Alexina Martinez, has helped put that together. So uh, we're seeing that a lot of people are taking advantage of that tool to review the budget and what it actually means on their tax bill. Right, yeah, thank you. I would encourage everyone to take a look at uh, the town's tr financial transparency center on our website. The, the new document is new and improved. Um, some may have found uh, the prior budget, uh, just a lot of numbers and kind of hard to follow, but this is a lot of uh, more graphic representation, uh, uh, charts and graphs to illustrate exactly how uh, we're going to spend those dollars. Great. Article 6 is another traditional article to accept a sum of money from uh, the Municipal Light Department's cable TV division. Could you explain uh, what that means, please? For sure. This is um, $800,000 that um, is proposed to be transferred from Selco cable operations to help reduce uh, the uh, tax rate for fiscal year 23. So it's a revenue. Article 7 is uh, somewhat similar, a, a traditional article to accept a sum of money from the municipal light department, which uh, is a separate sum than the cable TV. Right. So that is an additional $237,569 to offset the tax rate using a payment in lieu of taxes um, from the municipal light department, SoCo. Great. Article 8 is, again, another traditional article to accept uh, some of free cash to offset the budget with right. the tax rate. And this is a $500,000 appropriation to offset the tax rate and free cash is uh, a general reserve. Um, it's a year-end fund balance that's comprised of several different things, uh, but it is a reserve asset of the community, and we use $500,000 every year to uh, help manage the, the total tax rate and keep it as low as we can. Article 9 is something new that we uh, introduced last year related to the special purpose override stabilization account. We have several stabilization accounts. Uh, could you explain the status of the override stabilization account and what we 
uh, plan to contribute to that and why? Sure. So uh, with the voters in Shrewsbury in May of uh, 2021 adopting an operational override uh, to um, provide enough funding to uh, provide services that they request and expect from their local government, uh, we took a multi-year approach and developed a and devised a plan to uh, ensure that the operational override funding could be extended for as many years as possible, bring great fiscal stability uh, to the community rather than uh, fighting each year uh, to try to find enough money to operate uh, town municipal operations and school operations. And the primary vehicle to stabilize out years after the override request is approved is this special purpose override stabilization account. So uh, a few, for the first couple of years after the override, we will be adding money into the override stabilization account. Uh, last uh, May, we added 3,203,000. And through this article, we are seeking to put an additional 3 million into the override stabilization fund. Now in the out years, as we move beyond uh, the uh, immediate adoption of an override, we'll begin to draw down upon these funds um, as we're only able to increase the tax levy to and a half percent and we clearly demonstrated to community members that we need more than that to provide the services that they expect so uh, we're very pleased to be able to contribute three million dollars this year it's more than we had originally trans uh, uh, anticipated and the board of selectmen has worked very hard to extend the duration of the override and with this deposit um, th we are able to forecast that the override won't last for just four fiscal years but uh five fiscal years and this will be revisited on an annual basis but again this is a the initiative by the board of selectmen to maintain financial stability within the community great article 10 uh, deals with our general capital budget uh, which i believe funds are coming out of two accounts for that could you explain those accounts as well as what the spending plan is for capital this year Absolutely. So the primary account, so we're, we're, we plan to spend $1,463,000 for capital improvements and capital improvements are those investments that last for, have a useful life of greater than five years and or have an expenditure value of 50000 or more. Um, so uh, we plan to appropriate most of the funds from our uh, financial reserve of free cash that the total amount would be $1,363,252 from that source. And then we also plan to use 99902 from a previously approved uh, capital improvement initiative, which was to um, change uh, space uh, at the Shrewsbury High School to do some classroom renovations that we're uh, no longer going to pursue. So we want to reallocate those funds for a more useful purpose. So in total, that $1,463,000 uh, looks to fund a number of uh, unique initiatives uh, ranging across a number of different departments. Um, this includes, uh, but isn't necessarily limited to, uh, the purchase of new voting machines for the town clerk's office, that's $69,000, some information technology uh, upgrades for the police department. This is the first year of a two-year request to, to cover a, a new uh, computer-assisted dispatching and records management system for the department of $216,910. Uh, we're looking to acquire tasers for the entire police department uh, to ensure officers have those resources whenever uh, they may need to be used uh, uh, during the line of duty. And this is year one of a three-year a three-year cost of sixty-eight thousand uh, dollars. We'll look to purchase uh, a normal cycle of three ad additional uh, police cruisers. Um, a couple other of the major programs that we're uh, seeking to undertake would be the re uh, additional hundred um, and ninety-nine thousand dollars. Excuse me, hundred thousand dollars, adding to previous funds that we sought from town meeting to replace the town hall roof. Um, we're seeking to transfer that ninety-nine thousand dollars from the classroom renovation fund for the high school to making lighting upgrades within the Shrewsbury High School. Um, we are also looking to. Uh, purchase of a variety of equipment across several other departments, including um, an electric vehicle for the public buildings department, um, a new three quarter ton uh, pickup truck for the fire department for their operations, a new roadside mower, which would 
uh, allow us to stop leasing a uh, roadside mower each summer and use it throughout the entire summer by the, by the highway department to improve sight lines um, and general roadway safety visibility. Uh, a new dump truck uh, for the highway department for snow and ice and uh, fair weather operations. And finally, a, a heavy duty pickup for uh, the parks maintenance division uh, for their use in their operations. So um, again, that's our capital improvement plan across uh, the general municipal departments. Utilities have their own capital improvements, which will be described in a few minutes uh, by the water and sewer uh, superintendent and town engineer. Uh, so uh, that's the general capital improvement uh, plan at this point. All right, we're going to move on to Article 11, uh, which is the Solid Waste uh, Collection Enterprise Fund. So, uh, Mr. Mizikar, would you explain to us, uh, this is an annual uh, appropriation, how this uh, plays out for this uh, town meeting? Sure. So this uh, funds the operation of the curbside solid waste collection program and associated programs. Uh, the total budget request for this is $2,632,332 for fiscal year 23. And this is funded in part um, through the tax levy and in part through um, the income of the solid waste enterprise itself. That is the funding that we receive through the sale of bulky waste stickers and primarily the pays you throw a bag. So again, this just provides for uh, the the uh, funding that we need to uh, cover the cost of the contractor and associated disposal of the waste. Um, and along with um, our pay as you throw program, uh, most of our other utilities, uh, solid waste, stormwater, uh, water, sewer are all funded uh, through a separate fund outside of the general fund. So we can properly uh, balance them just like you would any other private business to ensure that the revenues that they raise are covering or at least covering the costs uh, associated with the operation of those programs. And those are called enterprise funds. Uh, and the, the next enterprise fund that we're, we will talk about is actually uh, the management of the sewer system. Uh, we are joined now by um, Water and Sewer Superintendent Dan Rowley, who will uh, get us up to speed on the operating budget for uh, the sewer for fiscal year 23. Um, thank you, Mr. Mizikar. And um, for both the water and sewer budgets, um, the approach I took this year, as I do every year, is to maintain a level budget for year-over-year -year operations while taking a detailed look at our expenses. Um, so this year I brought forward a budget for the sewer system that is um, essentially level funded with only um, the only changes would be in the salaries three where I included some support staff for the utility which includes um, and their shared positions between water and sewer so um, that includes one environmental regulatory and safety coordinator um, who is going to assist with water quality initiatives source protection water conservation programs safety security sampling analysis regulatory compliance emergency response planning and implementation and outreach initiatives um, they'll also take a lead role in developing an employee health and safety manual and supporting us um, as we see a number of regulations uh, coming forward in the next year, including some additional requirements with our NIPTES permit with the Westboro treatment plant and the sanitary sewer overflow notification regulations, which take effect on July 6th of this year. So um, it's definitely an area identified as needing some more staff to assist to ensure that we're complying with those regulations. The other position that um, I've included in again shared with water is a project manager who is going to assist us with a number of um, critical organizational organizational and capital projects including um, record keeping for water and sewer connections um, adhering to procurement laws we do a number of procurements for construction type projects between ten and fifty thousand dollars so there's a bit of effort there um, to ensure that we're complying with those laws so um, I've included that position um, again shared with water in um, in our sewer budget but overall I think in the last three years that I've been preparing the budget for the both departments I've got a good handle on our expenses that we're we're going to anticipate great yeah and this seems like Dan uh, what you've been doing over those three years you've been here is kind of modernizing the sewer department and making sure we have the appropriate professionals and staff in place to you know continue with all those ever increasing growing statutory legal requirements that we have for this system 
Great. Thank you so much. So, Dan, uh, did you want to talk about a little bit about Article 13, which is uh, about $2.6 million for capital improvements for the sewer system? Yes, I would. So, um, Article 13 is the capital budget needs for the sewer department, which includes um, $300,000 for our ongoing inflow and infiltration work, which this um, this year in FY23 will be our 12th and final year for the town, which means we've completed one full cycle of um, inflow investigation, which includes manhole inspections, um, flushing out and camera TV inspecting lines, um, and also doing flow isolation overnight where um, the contractors will actually block uh, a section of Maine and then determine if there's groundwater entering. We typically do that in the spring when groundwater is high. So it's valuable information as we try to control the inflow and infiltration that is ultimately sent to our wastewater treatment plants. Um, we've included $160,000 for pump station evaluations. We have 38 pump stations in town. So um, this is an ongoing program we have to evaluate existing stations to identify future capital needs. Um, we have $1.3 million in the budget for capital for pump station improvements, which includes work needed for um, some key stations, including um, Walnut Street. Uh, we're going to be in investing in a new pump station at Clue Street and ongoing upkeep of existing stations. We also have um, $300,000, which is half of the cost to replace our vac truck which is the big truck you see with the tank on the back and the big hose rail on the front which we use for a multitude of different uh, projects and emergency responses including water main breaks um, the front hose rail is a jetter for sewer backup so um, the existing truck is a 2006 so it's year, nearing the end of its useful life um, replacing one of our service vehicles and we also have money for our capital improvement reserve and our stabilization fund right um That'll take us into Article 14, Dan, which is the operating budget for the water. Uh, I know you talked about how it relates to sewer, but anything else of note for water operations? Um, yes. So um, in addition to sharing the two um, professional technical positions with sewer, I've also included one additional water and sewer laborer who will focus on water meter replacements. We want to have a, a program in place where we're, we're committed to replacing a thousand meters a year um, for uh, in per perpetuity, essentially, where we have about 10,000 residential meters in our system, and we want to have an ongoing program where we know the lifespan of those meters. Um, mm -hmm. So when we feel that doing it in-house with assistance from the business management division, working collaboratively, that we can have a good program and ensure that's um, that's completed because essentially that's that's how we generate our revenue and if those meters aren't functioning which as they tend to age they age um to the point where they they don't measure the water accurately to the benefit of the customer so it's just not you know we're not tracking all of our, our water so we think that's a vital program to have in place um, and then the second position that i added is an assistant water treatment plan operator so um, that is for um to have another person learning our water treatment plant for succession planning for down the road. Um, we're currently a treatment level three uh, system, which if somebody was to walk in the door without a license today, it would take uh, about four years to get fully licensed and be able to run that plant. Mm -hmm. So um, we want to invest to make sure that we have adequate staff. And I've made some adjustments in some of our expenses to offset the, the cost of, of mm -hmm. that staff, um, mm -hmm. just in reviewing over the years what we have spent. Um, and so that covers um, the majority of the budget. Um, one change that we did make um, as we're watching supply chain issues with our water production treatment chemicals, we did increase our budgeted amounts by 50%. Um, there's a high degree of uncertainty of what um, either the chemicals we use, which includes potassium hydroxide, sodium hypochlorite. Those two are, are critical for our production. So um, we're, we're not sure where they're going to be, but we're prepared for what may come forward. 
And Dan, I, I just wanted to circle back on the meter replacement program because I know Shrewsbury Town meeting members are pretty savvy. So they've always heard us talk about or folks have talked about unaccounted for water. So obviously more accurate metering means less unaccounted for water as well. So that's that's an important initiative for that program as well, I know. So thank you for for shepherding that in, uh, to this budget and changing how we, we do that. So um, that takes us to capital improvements for, for uh, the water system for fiscal year 23 in Article 15. Okay, and um, a number of capital improvements for this year, including water main replacement. Um, we've earmarked a little over half a million dollars for that, and we've identified three streets that we are going to be putting out to bid. Um, and again, we're it, the way the bidding market is and the climate is just so uncertain. Um, we're optimistic that number may be good, but we're not sure. But uh, we've enlisted those streets um, in the article. We're sharing the cost of the VAC truck with the sewer department. Um, we funded uh, our ongoing water tank maintenance plan, which um, we're including funds each year in our budget so we can have ongoing maintenance for our tanks. We have six tanks total. Four of them are steel, two are concrete. The four steel tanks require a fair amount of maintenance as the paint um, and coatings wear and they need to be um, upkept. Um, we have included a service vehicle for our meter replacement program. Um, and as I'd mentioned at the finance committee, we're looking at either a hybrid or electric vehicle to really um, see what we can implement effectively in that, in that role to reduce our fuel usage, um, replacing a service truck. We did include $40,000 to supplement previously allocated funds for valve exercise equipment. And this is due to cost increases from um, the supply chain issues and availability of equipment. So um, unfortunately, we're gonna need some more money for that. And then um, our annual uh, allotment to the Poor Farm Brook ongoing mitigation fund that we have. All right. Thank you, Dan. We appreciate all the insight on those articles. And we'll move into our final utility. And uh, we're joined by uh, town engineer Andy Truman, who will lead us through Articles 16 and 17. So Andy, welcome. And Article 16, if you wanted to touch upon the roughly one and a quarter million uh, operating budget for uh, stormwater services utility. And tell us what's going on there. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Miska. Um, so yeah, the um, stormwater utility obviously was um, approved by the uh, town meeting in 2017 um, 2019 the sewer commissioners brought in the bylaw um, it's really in relation to the EPA MS4 permit which is a, uh, a stormwater quality permit uh, that the town is under a mandate to do um, so we, we have assigned obviously utility fees to uh, every property in town and we take most of that money um, about a third of it goes towards salaries we have five full-time employees uh, four of them are engineering, and one we currently pay for a highway employee as well because they do a lot of the uh, street sweeping, the cash basin cleaning is done, obviously paid through that. Uh, the rest of it is contractual services. Um, it's a very um, labor-intensive uh, permit to, um, to comply with, so a lot of it is outsourced right now, so we have a lot of fees in there for um, outsourcing some of the help for the uh, utility work that we need doing. Um, we also have this year, we have probably one of the things we need to do, we have about 120 stormwater basins throughout the town that the town's owned, adopted through subdivision and um, uh, town improvements. So we're now looking to improve those this year. Um, this is gonna be a test pilot for us to do a contract. So I budgeted about $300,000 to make some improvements to those. Those hopefully contracts will be going out this year. Um, we usually have around about $75,000 in cash basin cleaning. So we, we sub some of the cash basin cleaning. We clean them twice a year, all the, um, the basins. Um, so we sub out some of it. The rest of it we do in-house with the highway department, and then we'll get into that with the capital. Um, and then the rest, <coughs> the rest is usually utilities, uh, utility cloud software allocation. So there's about $830,000 in um, you know, outsourcing fees. So that's um, mostly the operating costs um great so that allows us for the compliance with that federal and state permitting and then we also make some capital investments in stormwater uh through article 17 andy that's uh four hundred seventy nine thousand dollars this year so what what are our plans or requests there so typically when we do the highway improvements this year so we usually get around about a million just shy of a million dollars from chapter 90 to milling 
to milling and overlay. And typically what we do is when we do a street, we go in and we look at the stormwater uh, and we usually re replace any of the catch basins that do the need replacing. So this year, I think there's roughly about $235,000 worth of catch basin improvements just, just for the um, street improvements. Um, and then the rest is typically goes to just local projects around town. There are several uh, places in town that have stormwater problems that we will be looking to do designs this year and you know get them out on the street and get them funded. And then the other one is the, uh, the cash basin cleaner. There's uh, $245,000 in there for a cash basin cleaner. That's replacing the 1995 truck that are currently being used, which has kind of <laughs> exceeded its life expectancy. Um, so this will replace that truck. That truck does about 1,000 to 1,500 cash basins a year that we clean up with that one. Great. So that takes us through all of the uh, town utility associated articles and articles 11 through 17. So. Uh, thank you, Andy. Thank you, Dan, for uh, helping inform town meeting members, and we'll see you at town meeting. Thank you. So that was a great overview from uh, the utilities department related to their operating and capital budgets. We wanted to move on to Article 18 related to uh, a project at Oak, Oak Middle School related to window replacement. So, Mr. Mizikar, could you give us an overview of this article and why the MSBA is uh, related to that? Sure. So uh, last fall, we sought $50,000 to design the replacement of windows and doors at the Oak Middle School. Uh, and at that time, we reported that those uh, aspects of the building were over 40 years old as they were not upgraded during the most recent renovation of that school. So uh, we're now seeking the funds uh, to partner with MSBA dollars to actually complete the work, which would be done and authorized after the um, August meeting of the MSBA. The town is required to demonstrate we appropriate the entire cost of the anticipated cost of the project, which is $950,000. So in order to meet that requirement, we're proposing um, to transfer $455,000 from free cash and uh, I'll, have town meeting allow us to borrow up to four hundred ninety-five thousand um, dollars to cover that cost. So, um, although we are seeking a borrowing authorization, uh, given that the MSBA will actually be contributing fifty-two percent of the cost of this project, we do not anticipate ever having to borrow. But again, MSBA requires that we demonstrate that we have the full amount of funds, the nine hundred fifty thousand dollars on hand and available to us to cover the cost of the project, and then and only then would they can authorize their contribution of 52%. So um, this will require two thirds votes since we are seeking borrowing authorization. Um, but again, we don't intend to ever have to borrow those funds and under no circumstances would this be a debt exclusion. So it would not be a debt exclusion. Um, and we don't ever intend to borrow the funds, but we have to demonstrate that we have them all on hand. So uh, we'll look forward to making those upgrades and improving the energy efficiency and general um, well-being of the Oak Middle School. Great. Moving on to Article 19, this is a traditional article to pay the expenses of retired uh, disabled police and fire uh, fighters. Uh, could you explain uh, what the sum of money we're looking for town meeting to raise and appropriate and for the purposes? Sure, so that's $6,464 this fiscal year. Uh, Massachusetts General Laws Chapter one, uh, 41, Section 100B requires that uh, anytime someone uh, is disabled in the line of duty for police and firefighters that uh, their municipality is required to pay their out-of-pocket medical expenses. So if they have co-pays, uh, need durable medical equipment, or have other tests or studies that are directly associated uh, with their disability, the town pays any out-of-pocket cost that's not covered by insurance. Again, uh, that's $6,464 this fiscal year. And these uh, expenditures have all been reviewed and approved in detail through the town accountant's office. Great. Moving on to Article 20 is to make a payment or a transfer into the insurance trust fund. Uh, could you explain that dollar amount and that purpose? Sure. So the insurance trust fund is a new initiative that we put in place um, in fiscal year 22, which allows for additional financial stability. Uh, the town has insurance deductibles like many uh, 
individuals and private businesses have, and those deductible amounts that we actually incur on an annual basis vary from year to year. So we have deductibles on our uh, workers' compensation, injured in, uh, in the line of duty for police and fire and other property liability. And um, rather than seeking uh, a full appropriation each year to cover the total cost of what we may have to pay, uh, our, we propose to add hopefully smaller sums of money uh, throughout time to just ensure that we have enough to, to cover the upcoming year. So um, we're proposing to put $20,000 into this account. The current balance is $57,047. There are currently several uh, claims pending against that, so we see the need to, to add $20,000 at this town meeting. Thank you. Moving on to Article 21, uh, this is an article to move a sum of money into our general stabilization account, which we've had for a very long time. Sure, yep. So our general stabilization account is what local governments and governments at all level consider their general rainy day fund. We currently have uh, $3,060,994 in our general stabilization fund. The general stabilization fund would be drawn upon in unforeseen times for unforeseen circumstances to ensure um, the fiscal stability of the community and that we can respond normally in un uh, you know disaster situations or things like that. Um, so we are proposing to increase that by 750000 which would take it uh, the total level to two and three quarter percent of the proposed operating budget. And the policy goal of the Board of Selectmen is to ensure that there is 5% of any annual operating budget in the general stabilization account. So that's a work in progress, but we've made great progress over the last few years to get it up to over 50% of the policy goal. That's great news. Moving on to Article 22, this is again a fairly new article related to uh, raising. Uh, funds for uh, cable TV educational and government access. Sure. So this funds the operation of Shrewsbury Media Connection. And a, a few years ago, Shrewsbury Media Connection uh, became a private nonprofit and came f uh, outside the umbrella of Selco, where it had traditionally been. And the vast majority of, of the funds that we're seeking uh, through this, or $383,027, comes from revenue that's associated with the franchise fee and agreement with Selco uh, for cable operations. That's the primary source of funding for Shrewsbury Media Connection for uh, public access programming and, and channels. And in addition this year, which is new, is the town is appropriating or we propose to appropriate $12,000 from the general tax levy to the operations of Shrewsbury Media Connection. Now, it's no secret or surprise to anyone that as uh, individuals cut the cord and stop uh, purchasing traditional cable, um, that the franchise revenue, which is derived from total subscribers, declines. But uh, the Board of Selectmen see access to public meetings um, as critical for the knowledge and benefit of democratic values within the community. So that's why $12,000 is being proposed. And that $12,000 roughly funds the production and coverage of all public meetings throughout the course of the year by Shrewsbury Media Connection. So in total, it'd be $395,027. Great, thank you. Article 23 is a traditional article where we vote to um, set spending limits for certain revolving accounts. Uh, I believe there's two revolving accounts in this section. That's right. So the two accounts are the Council on Aging Transportation Fund, and we're seeking a proposed maximum expenditure of $75,000, and the Donahue Rowing Center Revolving Fund to manage uh, the operation of those facilities, uh, the revenue being derived from the rental of space down there of $400,000. So this, again, is uh, just using revenue that's generated for a from a particular source uh, back into that purpose. So we raise revenue for uh, Council on Aging Transportation, and we're going to use those revenues to cover the expenses of those programs. So moving on to Article 24, this is a traditional article where we are accepting funds from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts for funding highway projects. Right. So we are not accepting a specific amount of money, but the Commonwealth has indicated that 
uh, our formula for fiscal year 23 will provide $989,277. So we will accept any and all sums of money that are appropriated through the Chapter 90 program at the state level for use throughout the fiscal year. Um, and the reason we don't accept a particular sum of money is that occasionally uh, the Commonwealth appropriates more than it originally anticipated. So uh, fiscal year 22 is one of those years, and uh, the Commonwealth has appropriated an additional $500 thousand dollars for fiscal year 22 so I just wanted to illustrate why we don't accept a particular sum of money but again the traditional program for fiscal year 23 we anticipate receiving nine hundred eighty nine thousand two hundred seventy seven dollars for roadway repairs and improvements Great. Moving on to Article 25, this is uh, transferring some of money from the sale of cemetery lots to the cemetery department, which is a traditional article. It is, and it's $18,000. And as we uh, raise revenue from the sale of lots, those are transferred for the perpetual care and improvement and embellishment of the cemetery. Uh, so that's what we're seeking to do with uh, funding in Article 25. Great. Article 26 is to transfer money from free cash to uh, expenses associated with lakes, ponds, and waterways. Some may be thinking that we generally have an expense towards the uh, Lake Quinsigamond Association. Could you explain why we've brought in this uh, article a little bit more on the amount that we've allocated? Sure. As we um, all know, that Lake Quinsigamond may be the largest watershed and water body uh, within the town. But there are certainly other waterways, ponds, lakes throughout the community uh, that are managed uh, through the town, mainly through the Conservation Commission or often through the Conservation Commission, um, that are in need, are in need of attention. So while we'll you know, continue to support the Lake Quinsigamond Association and water quality in, the, in Lake Quinsigamond, we'd also like to uh, do our part in managing those other water bodies and assets of the community, whether it be for the mitigation of things like cyanobacteria that we see in Dean Park often throughout the summer months, or uh, Mill Pond, which is becoming uh, more and more uh, have higher and higher sediment levels and uh, we're seeing more and more weed growth so we would use those funds on a broader basis throughout the community for all bodies of water and waterways excellent um, article 27 is a new article and a standalone initiative to transfer a sum of money for the development of a climate action and resiliency mm -hmm. plan uh, mr mizakar can you explain how this came about and what we're looking to do with this article for town meeting members sure so this article was really a partnership with the board of selectmen and some very interested residents uh, around climate action plan those residents are known as tipping point and they uh, began engaging with the board of selectmen in the early winter months to talk about the town's approach to climate action uh, in reducing greenhouse gas emissions of the town as an organization um, and also preparing the town and its infrastructure to be resilient from those climate uh, change impacts that we are all seeing like increased rainfall higher uh, temperatures in the summer months things like that so that partnership has led to this initiative to create a climate action and resiliency plan um, and the climate action plan itself really has two primary components. First and foremost, it identifies or will create a plan for the town, local government as an organization to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. So we'll consider a plan for public buildings, uh, reduce of energy consumption, the type of energy that we use within these buildings. And then the same for our municipal fleet, our vehicles, should we transition them to uh, electric vehicles, hybrid vehicles, et cetera. So we'll lay out a very specific plan uh, and set specific goals for greenhouse gas emissions by the town as an organization. Now for the community and the residents of the town of Shrewsbury, this plan will not impose any requirements or restrictions on them, but it will provide them with information and resources for their consideration as they make their own investments. So it will provide up-to-date information and links and resources on electric vehicles, uh, systems related to your home, whether that's your heating system, the building envelope, the roof. So if in individuals are interested in making um, 
improvements to their home or have to uh, make changes to their home and they want to consider their own impact on climate change and reduce uh, their greenhouse gas emissions and, and footprint, uh, then this uh, plan would provide them with information. But again, there will be no requirements uh, for individuals through this plan. So um, we have high hopes that um, although we're requesting $140,000 because we believe that's what it will cost to develop this plan, uh, along with input from the community and um, sp specified consultants, that we may not need to use all of that free cash uh, because uh, Planning and Economic Development Department, who has been working over the last five years or more on a municipal vulnerability and preparedness through the state's MVP program, is also going to seek a grant for these initiatives. So any dollar that we receive from an external source, we would, of course, turn back the local funds uh, and not use them. Uh, but uh, this will be a great way to be much more strategic in how we uh, approach climate change and climate resiliency as a local government and inform the community about it. Great. And this also couples with our green communities designation that we already are doing a lot in our buildings to um, make actions towards using less energy and being more sustainable, but this will further that and really provide us a clearer direction on where we want to go as the municipal government and, and present options for our residents who wish to take those options. That's right. So Article 28 is part of our ongoing initiatives related to uh, revitalization of the Shrewsbury Town Center. So Chris, can you talk a little bit about what this phase of that uh, initiative looks like? Absolutely. So uh, just to give town meeting members a little bit of a background, we have been studying the town center uh, really before 2016 in the development of the Shrewsbury Master Plan and have incrementally worked with consultants and uh, town center stakeholders and other stakeholders within the community on uh, a parking analysis, wayfinding, a visioning for the town center, uh, Beale redevelopment and the like. And um, what we've really noticed is that uh, there seems to be a perception that there might be uh, traffic congestion or more commercial vehicles in the town center and that might be deterring people from using our town center or occupying our town center. So um, this article seeks to transfer $230,000 from free cash to fund the development of a town center comprehensive transportation and multimodal study. Um, what that means is that we would go out to bid with a request for proposals to qualified uh, transportation and traffic uh, study consulting firms to understand first what is the baseline? Um, how many trips per day are we seeing in the town center? How many trucks are we seeing in the town center? Uh, how many pedestrians are we seeing? How many bicyclists? Um, and then developing some strategic plans to um, move the town center forward uh, with the vision that we have set forth with our many studies. Um, we currently have a WRTA bus route 15 that goes through the town center. Uh, we have a lot of students and others walking. Um, so it's really, again, like I said before, not just about how cars, trucks, and uh, commercial vehicles navigate the town center. It's also that multimodal sense of bicyclists and pedestrians. And we hope to have um, some outcomes that we can implement in the future, whether it be uh, closing down roadways to one-way traffic only or rerouting commercial uh, vehicles, working with their um you know, their managers, their regional managers, uh, or something else. Um, and we definitely recognize that this is our um, showpiece of the town and we'd like to investigate that further. So really looking forward to that. It also builds off of some of the um, items that we've heard at past town meetings related to uh, looking at truck traffic in the town center. It relates to some of the feedback that we're collecting on our strategic plan related to uh, congestion and the like. So wanted to just get some baseline first and then some initiatives that we could work forward to uh, continuing our um, d redevelopment of the town center. Great. We'd like to explain a little bit more about Article 29 as this is a new article that uh, past town meeting members have not seen. Uh, this is related to the Community Preservation Fund, directly related to the adoption of the Community Preservation Act in uh, 2020. So um, I have Mr. Mizikar, the town manager, and Mr. Cahill, the director of planning and economic development. Um, Mr. Mizikar, could you explain a little bit about why we need to accept uh, the revenues and the appropriations for the CPA, um, and especially related to fiscal year 22 and 23? 
Absolutely. So this will become an annual uh, Warren article and the underpinning uh, state statutes require that the town estimate the amount of funding it will receive uh, through uh, the CPA for the upcoming fiscal year. And again, since uh, we actually started receiving funds uh, July 1st of 2021 within the current year, but didn't have the opportunity at the last May town meeting to be in a position to be able to estimate that. We need to catch up and do two years. So this should be the only year that we have to include two fiscal years, but this is uh, estimating and uh, moving, uh, pr taking particular actions on certain groupings of funding uh, through the Community Preservation Act act for fiscal year 22 and 23. Great, thank you so much. All right, we're gonna transition into the articles that deal with changes to the zoning bylaw and start with article 30. So I'd like to welcome uh, Rowan McAllister. She's our assistant town planner who primarily oversees the Zoning Board of Appeals and the Community Preservation Committee. Um, Rowan, article 30, as I understand it, is some changes to the zoning bylaw related to pre-existing non-conforming uses. Could you just give us a general overview of that and what changes town meeting members would be looking to uh, view when they are at town meeting on May 21st. Sure. Thank you, Kristen. So with the assistant of town, assistance of town council, we've changed this language to better reflect state statute. And the main changes occur in section C of the proposed uh, zoning language. And that essentially in introduces um, language that no longer will require a special permit from the Zoning Board of Appeals if the proposed alteration to the pre-existing non-conforming single or two-family dwelling does not increase the nature of the non-conformity. So to further illustrate this point, we've added items one through four, and each identifies a scenario that no longer will require a special permit. So number one is in regards to conforming alterations on non-conforming lots. So let's say you have an undersized lot and you'd like to expand your home uh, you no longer will need a special permit if that expansion conforms to all the applicable setback requirements. Number two relates to conforming additions on non-conforming structures. So let's say a home has a non-conforming front yard setback, but you're proposing an, a conforming addition in the rear. You can proceed with that addition with no special permit from the Zoning Board of Appeals. The third is a like-for-like -like replacement of non-living non space. So that would be if you have a deck in disrepair, you can go ahead and remove and replace that structure, even if it's outside of the setback envelope. And then lastly is the demolition of a non-conforming, a portion of a non-conforming structure that would reduce the extent of the non-conformity. Great, and we have a series of uh, exhibits that show what this might mean. So hopefully we'll post that on this, uh, briefing and at town meeting if there's any questions we can certainly show those graphics or um, town meeting members can call the planning and economic development department and speak with you or bernie cahill directly correct absolutely yes great thank you so much rowan for presenting this article and looking forward to seeing you at town meeting thank you all right, we're gonna move on to Article 31 of the Town Meeting Warrant. Uh, with us, we have the Director of Planning and Economic Development, Bernard, K Bernard Cahill. Uh, he will help walk us through Articles 31 through 35. So as I understand it, we're making some changes under Article 31 to our site plan approval process with the Planning Board related to slopes and grading. So Bernie, if you could just give us a brief overview of the thought process behind this and what it would mean for projects moving forward related to this article. Certainly. So this article is in response to um, construction that we've been seeing lately that includes a lot of steep slopes in town. So lots of steep grades, tall slopes, uh, retaining walls associated with that. So that's the reasoning behind it. What it would do is it would require that any slope that's disturbed with a grade of two to one, that's 10 feet or higher, so 50 degree slope, would require site plan approval from the planning board. This would allow planning board to review the project and it would also allow it to be sent to peer review from a geotechnical review engineer to make sure that the slope is sound, any retaining walls are also sound and that the whole structure works. Great, and generally the projects that are going for site plan approval for general projects would comply with this as well and be in site plan approval anyway. So in most cases, it would not be an added Correct, uh, but we're a future, so an existing site, so maybe a site's approved today, but in three or four years, 
were to change an existing retaining wall that got built today, um, that they would have to come back to make sure that any changes, improvements, what have you, also um, are you know, workable uh, solutions and changes. Great. And for town meeting members that might not know what a two to one slope is or 10 feet really means, we're preparing an exhibit and can show it on this uh, publication as well to give them a graphic representation. Correct. It'll be shown here and it will also be in their packets. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, Bernie, let's move on to Article 32, where we are talking about uh, changes to uh, numbering and whatnot as a uh, tactical sense with the town clerk's office. What does this mean for the zoning bylaw? Right. So Article 32 would give the power to the town clerk to amend and change the numbering and alphanumeric numbering of the zoning bylaw without having to return to town meeting for a two-thirds vote. What this does is it allows over the decades as changes get made to the zoning bylaw for the town clerk when they notice if something's falsely or incorrectly numbered, if a table of contents say um, doesn't match up with the page number that it says it does for a subsection, that they could adjust that to match up. So if the subsection on site plans, for example, is page 60, but the table of contents has page 50 now because changes have been made and it wasn't caught, they would be able to change that to say page 60 and be the correct page without a two-thirds vote and bringing it to town meeting. Great. And is this common for other municipalities? Obviously, Shrewsbury has not had it in their zoning bylaw, but do other municipalities in Massachusetts have this in their zoning bylaw? Yeah, that's a good question. And the answer is yes, they do. Um, and we also ran this by town council to make sure that uh, he was comfortable with it. And we did get town council's approval to proceed. Great. That's really helpful. Let's move on to Article 33. Article 33 deals with a section of the zoning bylaw that relates to common driveways, and this is related to common driveways for both residential and commercial and industrial uses. Uh, Bernie, could you walk us through the changes that are proposed related to Article 33? Right. So town meeting members will see a few lines through a few words, but really the gist of it and the main thrust of this uh, Article 33 is to limit the number of units that can access and use a, a residential common driveway. There are no changes being made to commercial industrial uses and common driveways, just to residential. So the number of residential lots would remain at three as it is today, but there would now be an upper cap on how many units in total. So if you had three lots and one was a duplex and two were single families, that would be your maximum. You couldn't put a fourplex or multi-family on one of those lots and get up to say 12, 13, or 14 units accessing an 18 foot wide common driveway. And that's really the intent of this article. Great, and we have an exhibit prepared as well to let the, have the public understand that a little bit more. We do, correct. Right, excellent. All right, we'll move on to Article 34, which deals with parking lot landscaping in our limited industrial zoning district. Uh, and as I understand it, we'd like to um, make some changes related to what we're seeing in the field and what is common practice in the limited industrial district. Can you explain that a little bit further for the public? Absolutely. So Article 34, as you just described, is for limited industrial uses, so industrial uses in the limited industrial zoning district only and to be between those lots so currently what's required between say a, uh, a storage and warehousing um, facility and say something to do with um, manufacturing it's required that a, a five foot strip be provided between those two lots however we're finding that it's one it's it's not necessary um, they're not protecting they're not shielding from anything um, and two, enforcement of this is very challenging also, um, and we do have some exhibits explaining this and showing this um, where you can see it. I wanted to emphasize though for sure that there was no change to the buffering requirement between uh, an industrial lot and a, a uh, private or public roadway, and there's no change to um, buffering or screening with residential lots or uses. So that's not changing. This is simply between two industrial uses um, adjacent to one another. Yeah, it's really helpful to uh, make that distinction of the public roadway and the residential lots, as I think people would be questioning that. Great. Let's move on to Article 35. Article 35 uh, came before the Board of Selectmen after consultation with staff, uh, Planning and Economic Development Department, Town Manager's Office, uh, when developers inquired on increasing the uh, permitted height for buildings in the limited industrial zoning district, as well as loading and unloading in the front of the building uh, in the limited industrial zoning district. Bernie, could you take us through what the um, requirements are today in the limited industrial related to that? 
and what is being proposed as part of this article as a change? Right. So currently, um, loading and unloading is only permitted in the rear of a building, uh, of a, an industrial building. This would allow for it to be um, provided through special permit to be on the side or the front of a building. Um, currently, if a if a building wanted, um, excuse me, a developer wanted to put loading on the front of a building, they'd need a variance. And we have a recent case for this down on Hartford Turnpike. Uh, the reason for that is they wanted to pull the noise and the disruption away from the residential area behind them. Um, they did have to go through the variance process. This would allow them to go through the special permit process with the planning board, which is a lower threshold, not proving a hardship, but still having to show that it's not detrimental to the neighborhood. Um, the other one is, so currently the maximum height, allowable height um, by right in the limited industrials district is 50 feet. This would allow, uh, again, through special permit by the planning board, which does require a four out of five vote, for heights up to 75 feet. So anything over 50 feet up to 75 feet, but no further, um, would go through a special permit process with the planning board. Uh, this was done after consultation. So this was brought to us and is being petitioned by um, a landowner in town. Um, but we've done our research, um, the planning department has, and taken a look at um, modern facilities, warehousing, distribution, logistics, and it is showing that building sizes for class A types buildings and tenants is getting taller. Um, again, this would allow some protection though. However, this isn't opening um, the gates to anything um, except for, um, well, up to 75 feet, but through special permits. So it does allow the board to still maintain um, the right to add conditions as they see fit or to deny if they feel like the um, project is not in cohesion with the neighborhood. Great. So we have done our research with other municipalities who have similar type of uses and see that this is consistent with what they're doing as well. Yes, that's right. So throughout Massachusetts, there's a, a wide variety of maximum height. Some are as low as, um, as ours at 50, so I say low, but that was their maximum, all the way up to 110 mm. feet. So we took what we thought in the median area, um, sorry, in the area, the median height, which is around 75 feet. So that is what we're um, proposing um, to change in the zoning article, Article 35. Great. And I think um, I gave this example in the Finance Committee public hearings, but our tallest building in town is the Shrewsbury Towers on North Quinsigamond Avenue. That's about 96 feet in height. So if people are driving by and see that as an example, right. uh, this would be about 25 feet. Lower than yeah, that and I think it's also that. worth saying that when we're talking about feet um, for heights, it may not be the whole building, maybe a portion of building, it may be a loading bay that is needs to be higher than some of the other loading bays. So that clear height might be just a few bays that are up to 75 feet or 65 feet or what have you, and the other ones might be 50 feet. Um, so it really just provides that flexibility for um, these developers and different tenants. And the planning board would be reviewing that as a special permit, but most likely these developments would be before the planning board as well for site plan approval, and you'd be reviewing the stormwater and the site design and the architecture of the building as well. Correct, and there are setbacks in these areas as well that developers would have to pay attention to, so they wouldn't be on top of any property. They would be set back from property lines as well. Thank you so much for Article 35. So that will take us to uh, Article 36, which is a tree care and maintenance bylaw. Um, and Kristen, I'll just kind of walk through that real briefly. It's, it's an interesting uh, addition to our bylaw. Um, it really will codify uh, through the legislative process how we will care for public trees. Uh, there's an underlying purpose behind this, though, as well, is that having a bylaw and establishing uh, the forestry committee that would be uh, initiated through this bylaw uh, means that we may be able to achieve designation as a Tree City USA. Uh, that's a designation that a lot of folks may recognize in their travels across the Commonwealth and other parts of the country. So it's a it's a it's a designation that's recognized nationally, and it also uh, provides comes with benefits and that we would be eligible for grants. Um, and other uh, funding from outside of the town that we're currently not eligible for. So it, it doesn't do a lot to change our business operations. It just puts them into uh, uh, a bylaw and then really gives us that unique opportunity to create the Forestry Commission and uh, seek outside funding if we are able to receive designation as a Tree City USA, which we will um, pursue at this point, if this would be adopted. 
point, we'd like to welcome in Principal Assessor Ruth Anderson to the conversation regarding the um, May of 2022 annual town meeting warrant. Uh, we'll consider uh, articles 37 through 40. Um, and these are all related to uh, new initiatives to provide relief to certain taxpayers within the community. Uh, the Board of Selectmen had identified uh, to the voters last spring when the operational override had come uh, into play that they would do everything that they possibly could to find tax relief for those who may be eligible. Uh, and through the diligence of Ms. Anderson uh, and the board, um, we are proud to present uh, these four warrant articles for town meetings consideration. So Article 37 um, is the first of those four articles. And Ruth, would you be able to talk a little bit about what is proposed for that article? Sure. So there are four order articles on the warrant. Uh, three of them are changing programs that are already in place. And one of them is a new program that we're proposing, and that's Article 37. So what we're hoping to do is create a tax relief fund that will benefit seniors and disabled persons of low income within the community. And in concert with that, there will be a tax aid committee created that will um, be comprised of myself as principal assessor, the treasurer collector, and then two members of the community that are, I'm sorry, three members of the community that are appointed by the Board of Selectmen. The purpose of this fund is very similar to the scholarship fund that's already in place in Shrewsbury, where people can donate money, pay a little extra on their tax bill, it goes into a specified fund, and then is distributed out to those that qualify. So rather than graduating seniors from high school, this is going to be for people that um, need it the most. So the elderly, the disabled, and the people that are of low income. So they would apply to the committee we would develop our parameters and an application form. It's an annual thing, so um, the intention is whatever money comes in would go out to those that qualify. Great. So Article 38 and 39 or 40, um, you said are uh, building on or changing some existing taf re tax relief initiatives that we have. So what are we looking to accomplish with Article 38? So Article 38 would increase the amount of the credit that is granted to people that qualify for an exemption based on their age, their income and assets, um, and uh, disabled status, so either a disabled veteran or if they're legally blind. So the state does require that we offer a certain credit amount, and this article um, under local op option would allow us to double that amount. So if the state says we have to give 400, we could double it and give 800. Great. And then if we just want to move on uh, to 39 and 40, sure. it's a similar situation where we already offer these credits by law. But what these will allow us to do is um, kind of loosen the parameters a little bit, make them a little bit more generous. So the parameters that are in the law have not kept track with inflation and income and assets and things like that and the income asset limits are incredibly low so that not many people actually qualify so what we'd like to do is make those limits more generous so that more people qualify for the credits that we already offer by law great so this would increase someone's maximum income or total assets that they maybe have but still be eligible for some tax. that's rate. exactly right awesome Great. These sound like great initiatives and will provide meaningful relief, and we appreciate your initiative in bringing them forward. Thank, Thank you, Ruth. Thank you very much. So we're going to move on to Article 41 and 42. Um, Mr. Mizikar, if you'd explain these, they're related to uh, cost of living adjustments and other adjustments related to our town's retirees. Right. So... Um, Many folks know that um, if you work a specified number of years and reach a specified age, you're eligible for a defined pension with the town of Shrewsbury as an employee. So Article 41 um, seeks to actually increase the amount of an individual retiree's pension that's subject to a cost of living adjustment on an annual basis. So right now, only the first $12,000 of um, money earned through a pension on an annual basis is subject to a cost of living increase. 
This is very different um, than individuals who may be familiar with uh, federal Social Security, where your full Social Security um, check is subject to a cost of living increase. That is not the case on a local government pension in the Commonwealth. So uh, we, the Retirement Board is seeking town meetings approval to increase the, the base amount that's subject uh, to the adjustment from $12,000 to $14,000. Now the maximum that um, is allowed to be subject to a pension and anywhere anywhere in the state is $18,000. So again, we're moving it from its lowest up $2,000 to 14. And at least 60% of communities um, that have a pension system have increased it to at least $14,000. So uh, this is something the Retirement Board committed to looking at after uh, we were fully funded and all accrued liability had been satisfied and that was achieved on January 1st, 2021. So they are seeking to uh, allow for a greater cost of living adjustment. Um, and the second article, which is Article 42, um, is a article that town meeting has considered in the past two other times uh, and they've adopted it or approved it and it's something that needs revisited uh, every so often so it was previously considered on uh, may of 1988 and may of 2002 and this would increase the base salary for pension calculation of individuals um, who were uh, disabled in uh, their service to the town um, there's currently 12 retirees that would be eligible for this increase. And what it would do is increase their pension calculation from whatever it currently is up to 50% of the current base salary of the position that they were disabledly retired from. So that means uh, in particular, like if a, if a police officer um, was injured in the line of duty and had to retire, um, their pension now would be based upon 50% of a current patrol officer salary versus whatever it was adjusted to prior in May of 2002. So really the intent behind both of these articles is to just ensure that um, our pension system and retirees are able to have um, meaningful income uh, under today's uh, current uh, economic environment. Great. So we're going to move on to Article 43. Uh, this is a new article on the warrant. Uh, we have done a great deal of research related to town-owned parcels, and this deals with transferring parcels from tax title custodian to town manager's office. So, Mr. Mizikar, would you explain the research that we've done and what this article means in terms of the town-owned parcels? Sure. So really over the past uh, hundred plus years, the town uh, has taken a lot of property for the non-payment of taxes. And there was, not surprisingly, a, a, a bulk of properties that were taken during the Great Depression, not the most recent Great Recession, but the, the, the Great Depression. Um, and they've kind of just sat there fallow uh, under the town's control, does, you know, taken for non-payment of taxes. And we've never really developed a plan on how to use them, what to do with them, how to make them a resource of the community. So um, we, uh, our research has indicated there are 102 parcels of land uh, that fall into that general category that comprise a total of about 95 acres. Um, so these are really tiny lots on average or median size of the lot is a little over a tenth of an acre. Um, and by transferring them out of the tax title custodian, we're doing a couple things. We're signifying that we're not going to dispose of them, you know, through a sale or auction just to recover funds. Uh, but we'd like to study what an appropriate use for them would be, whether we should designate them as open space, conservation land, affordable housing purposes, or other things like that where the town would really control the outcome. Now, uh, a more, uh, another underlying factor of this is, is that uh, as these properties sit there, um, they may be subject to what's known as adverse possession, where if someone uses them for greater than 20 years, if they're not further protected and only designated uh, by their tax title taking, we could be subject to that. Um, so we're really trying to preserve the assets of the taxpayers of Shrewsbury, that the interest that they own in this land. Uh, and then we will be rapidly moving into developing a plan for the future use of this to um, hopefully create more open space and other uh, beneficial uses to the community uh, more than they are now just sitting fallow as kind of undetermined uses of land. 
Great, thank you. We'll move on to Article 44. This is to uh, vote to transfer several pieces of land from the tax title custodian to the care, custody, and control of the Board of Selectmen. Mr. Mizikar, will you explain uh, how this is different than the last article and what this article is meant to accomplish? All right. So first, it's similar in that these land, these properties were taken for non-payment of taxes over um, quite some time. Um, these are four particular parcels. Um, three of them I'll carve out, 33 Eaton Avenue, 25 Harvard Avenue, and 210 North Quinsigamond Avenue, all have encroachments on them. Uh, and as I uh, described uh, during Article 43, um, when someone encroaches upon the land and uses it for and demonstrates its use for greater than 20 years, they have the ability to go to the court system and claim what's known as adverse possession and basically do a taking of, of this land. So that can't be done against a municipality if land is designated for a particular purpose or use. But since these lands, again, were only taken by tax title and then not put to any use or purpose by the town, they are potentially subject to it. So we've worked with these property owners who have encroachments and have identified a path of mutual benefit, hopefully. Um, so allowing the Board of Selectmen the right to dispose of these properties under uh, favorable terms and conditions would give us the opportunity to sell off these parcels of land, uh, potentially to the abutters uh, who have encroached upon it uh, for their use and return it uh, to taxable land and begin to uh, collect taxes on it as well. So I say potentially to the encroachers because these will have these lands will all have to go through a competitive process as is required by Chapter 30B of the general law. So there'll have to be some competitive nature to this transaction, whether it's offered to all individuals that abut the property or whether we go through a more uh, traditional process like a sealed bid um, proposal where individuals uh, develop a, uh, the cost that they would pay for the property and then submit it to the town and we take the highest bidder and sell the land to them. So those are those three parcels. And then uh, the final parcel is 12 Cedar Road. This is a 1,100, almost 1,200 square acre, acre parcel that does not currently have an encroachment upon it, but it is a tiny sliver of land that's virtually unusable by itself. Uh, and an abutter uh, to this property has identified their interest in purchasing it. Their interest in purchasing it, purchasing it would obviously bring it back to the tax rolls. And again, this would have to be competitive. So uh, either all abutters would have the opportunity to bid on this parcel or we'd go through a broader sealed bid process to uh, generate the highest value in the sale of this land. So again, uh, this is uh, taking care of uh, cleaning up the use of our land and um, dealing with some encroachments on town taxpayer land in what we believe is the most advantageous and mutually beneficial way that we possibly can since uh, three of these parcels already have uh, encroachments upon them. And allowing the Board of Selectmen to dispose of them, of course, would put them back on the tax rolls and uh, reap longer term benefits to the community. So, uh, Kristen, that takes us to what once was a very traditional and regular uh, reoccurring article, uh, street acceptances. Article 45 proposes to accept um, two different uh, roads as public ways to be uh, owned and controlled by the town of Shrewsbury for public purposes. So could you talk to us a little bit about articles uh, Article 45, excuse me. Absolutely. So Article 45 has two components. Um, as, as Mr. Mizikar had alluded to um, past town meetings, it would have been very traditional to accept uh, ways to lay out as public. We have not had uh, many in the past few years. Um, the distinction here is how the way has been created. So Lake Street um, is the first item on the article and it uh, show, seeks to uh, lay out a portion of Lake Street and this is really in uh, relation to and proximity of the new Beale School at 214 Lake Street. Uh, when that project was being built there was a need uh, for a change in that roadway alignment for safety and um, slowing the traffic and we did change uh, how that roadway was laid out the parameters of that roadway so this article seeks to accept the new bounds of Lake Street in that location 
The second portion of the article asked to accept Commerce Road as a public way. Uh, Commerce Road was created many, many years ago uh, through the subdivision control process with the planning board. The developer of that uh, industrial subdivision has been working over many years to uh, create that roadway, construct the roadway. Uh, they have the tenants and the new owners along that roadway, and now they are looking for the town to accept that. Uh, what that means is the developer would no longer be required to maintain that roadway in terms of salting and plowing in the winter um, and uh, maintaining catch basins and stormwater and the like, and the town would accept that. Um, this is might be a little foreign to some because this is an industrial roadway, but it really is no different than any of the residential subdivision roads that had been accepted in the past years. Um, and the planning board, uh, board of selectmen, and engineering departments have all reviewed these two acceptances. The roadways have been built to town standards, have been top course paved, are in, and are in tip-top condition for the town to accept uh, and put on our rolls. Um, and with this, we increase our lane mile, mile lane miles. Um, for Chapter 90 allocation. So we would receive a slight increase in our Chapter 90 dollars for the next fiscal year if town meeting accepts this roadway. So Mr. Mizikar, we'll transfer to Article 46, uh, which is an article brought before uh, town meeting members from the Board of Selectmen uh, related to a name change of the Board of Selectmen. Could you explain this? Sure. Um, as has occurred in many communities across the Commonwealth, um, the Board of Selectmen through this article is uh, seeking town meetings uh, consideration for changing their name to a gender neutral term from Board of Selectmen to Select Board. Um, for the town of Shrewsbury, there's a little bit different uh, process than other communities that have a, a formal charter. Um, we have a charter, but it was created before home rule was allowed in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Um, so, uh, we will have to petition the general court, the state legislature, for their approval in, in updating um, the acts of 1953 associated with uh, the town of Shrewsbury to change the name of the Board of Selectmen to Select Board. Uh, and also, uh, this article would update from Board of Selectmen and Selectmen to Select Board and all of the general bylaws. So again, it is just modernizing the name uh, that is our uh, elected executive body of the town from Board of Selectmen to a gender neutral select board. Thank you. So we'll move on to Article 47, which is a traditional article related to the Wright and Harlow Charitable Trust Fund. Yep, so this is just a very simple traditional article where we are compelled through the establishment of this trust uh, to name trustees at each and every annual town meeting. Uh, annual town meeting, so we propose uh, five uh, people to be the trustees of the Wright and Harlow Charitable Trust. Great. And on to our 48th and final article for town meeting. Uh, Mr. Mizikar, could you explain uh, this article related to the town and the Westboro treatment plant? Sure. So um, the town established an intermunicipal agreement through town meeting in 1979. Um, to, uh, to have a partnership with Westboro for um, solid, excuse me, uh, wastewater treatment, sewer treatment. Uh, and this partnership has lasted uh, all that time um, under the, uh, the current document that's been in place since 1979. In 2012, the general laws were updated uh, and shifted the ability uh, for intermunicipal agreements to be managed through the executive body rather than the legislative body, so through the Board of Selectmen. So what we're attempting to do now uh, proactively uh, before any changes are needed, which we anticipate some in the future with, with this agreement, is to transfer the authority of the control of that document from town meeting uh, to uh, the Board of Selectmen. And obviously, um, this would just allow us to be more efficient in our operations as town meeting meets twice a year and the Board of Selectmen often meet uh, more than two times a month. So it would allow them to consider this change in the due course of business. Obviously, the operation of sewer is a part of the executive body of the organization. So that makes more sense as well. So really just updating uh, the authority that controls uh, this document for the town. Uh, so it's clearly demonstrated who has that control. 
And with that, that uh, concludes uh, our overview of all 48 Warren articles for the May 21st, 2022 annual town meeting, which will occur at 8.30 a.m. on sa on that Saturday at the uh, Oak Middle School. Um, we hope that this information uh, prepares town meeting members better uh, for conducting business uh, at town meeting. We look forward to seeing each and every one of you uh, there at town meeting and answering any questions that you may have. I'll also remind uh, town meeting members there's one additional opportunity to engage in the process of town meeting prior to it. Uh, on May 19th, the moderator will hold a pre-town meeting to answer any questions you may have about the process. Uh, that will begin at 6 p.m. and will be located at the Oak Middle School. So please rely upon the resources that we talked about at the beginning of this taping, uh, as well as the information we provided herein to help make your decisions on behalf of the community as the legislative body. We'll see you on May 21st.